Thank you. You may be seated. Only one thing thrills my soul. It's Jesus. I hope you mean that when you sing it. The only thing that truly thrills your soul is Jesus. Amen. All right, please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage in Exodus 12 that we read just a few moments ago. Listen carefully or die, part two. We're moving into the study of the Passover. It's a magnificent study. It's a huge study. It's a study not only here in Exodus chapter 12, but it's all the way through the Old Testament. It's all the way through the New Testament. It specifically speaks of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover lamb for us. Last week, as we began this series, we added a few additional thoughts to what we had seen previously back in chapter 11. In Exodus 11, 1, it said, One more plague will I bring upon Pharaoh. God determines the end from the beginning. Israel did not know how many plagues there would be, but God knew. Pharaoh did not know how many plagues there would be, but God knew, because God had determined it. We need to remember that God determines the end from the beginning, and he determines the timing of all events in history. We do not know the day of the rapture, but it will be soon. I do believe that. You look at world history, you look at things around us, you see the nation of Israel today back in the land. The time is ripe. It's time for the end. The second thing that we noted in that verse was the people of Egypt were very kind to Israel that final night, giving them their gold and silver, and they found great favor in their sight. But that very night, if the Egyptians did not have the blood on the door, their firstborn died. It was not enough to be nice to God's people. You had to have the blood over the door. It's not enough to be nice and kind to others and a humanitarian. You have to have the blood over the door. We saw also that there were people who thought Moses was a very great man in the land of Egypt, verse 3. That's the reason for the mixed multitude that goes out with Israel as they leave the land, but they are a snare to the people later on. And in every church, there are those who are of the mixed multitude. They are not truly saved, but they are sort of going along with God's people, but they, they provide a snare. They have some inroads to lead God's people into sin. Then we saw in verse 4, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt. And we talked about the parallels in Psalm 110, verse 1 through 7, which deals with the second coming of Christ. It's a very important messianic psalm. And in verse 4 it says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And that word willing we talked about was the word for a free will offering in the day of thy power. And the word translated power is the word that elsewhere throughout the Old Testament is translated armies. And the beauties of holiness, which is a word that's used to describe the, the holy festive garments, the white garments worn by the priests, from the womb of the morning, the shachar, total blackness, gives you a description of what's found over in the book of Revelation. When Christ comes back riding on the white horse and the armies in heaven follow him clothed in linen, white and clean. And it's when all the lights have been turned out, the sun has been extinguished, the stars and the moon have been extinguished. It's total utter blackness as described here in this psalm. And then we find verse four very important because it refers to our Lord Jesus Christ, which speaks of the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews chapter seven makes it very clear that that is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at the passages in Revelation where his kingdom is full of darkness. We saw the water was dried up of the Euphrates, like the parting of the Red Sea in the Exodus, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We saw the three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, spirits of devils working miracles, like we saw Pharaoh's magicians. There is so much parallel between Exodus, what's going on in Exodus, and what's going on in the book of Revelation. We saw that at the end of that, chapter 16, which is the bold judgments, 
that there fell on men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, 120 pounds per hailstone, large hailstones. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, for the plague there was exceeding great, like the plague of hail in Egypt. Chapter 17 deals with religious Babylon destroyed. Chapter 18 deals with political Babylon, economic destroyed. Chapter 19, the second coming at the end of the tribulation. We looked at Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 7. It had quite a study on Melchizedek and how Melchizedek is actually a theophany, an appearance of Christ prior to the incarnation as he appears multiple times in different forms in the Old Testament. And we're told that in the New Testament as well. This man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He is our great high priest. Now back to the text. As we looked at chapter 11, we saw that on that night of the Exodus, even though there was death all over the land of Israel, uh, Egypt, it said that not even a dog moved his tongue against the children of Israel. There was no barking when several million people got up and walked out in the middle of the night. God stopped their mouths. God has a way of doing that. God has a way of stopping the mouths of all those who would speak against his actions. And there will come a day when he stops every mouth. All those who would blaspheme him, all those who would curse him, all those who would doubt him, all those who would criticize him, every mouth will be stopped. And Jesus will be the only one speaking. That's our God, people. When the Lord thunders, earth is silent. We looked at the summary of the law of harvest. We'll not go over that again. We've covered it on many different occasions because we want to get to the second part of this text for today. Verse 2 says, Exodus 12, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The very first thing that Passover speaks of to the Jews is a new beginning. But it's not merely a new beginning, it is a new beginning in faith. You see, if they didn't believe the word of God, they would not put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. They would not put the blood of the lamb over the lintel. And by the way, if you can see that, imagine the blood on the top post, the lintel, dripping down. And then you've got blood on either side that forms a cross. The cross was in the door, a cross covered with blood. Dear people, that's what it takes to avoid the angel of death. And it is a new beginning in faith, not merely a new beginning. It's the new beginning of a new life, of a new calendar. It's a new beginning in the faith of Israel. This year, Passover began on Saturday, April 4th at sundown and ended on Resurrection Sunday, April 5th at sundown. The Jewish month Nisan or Aviv, it's written Aviv in your text, but it's Aviv like in Tel Aviv. That's the tale of spring corn. Moves on our calendar each year because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar rather than a solar calendar like the one that we function on. We function on the Julian calendar. The Jews also have what they call Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year. That's their secular new year. That begins on the first and second of Tishri. This month, uh, this year in 2015, that began at sundown on September 14th and ended on sundown September 15th. It also moves because, of course, they're on a lunar calendar of 30 days. So every now and then they add an extra month uh, at the end of their year so that everything will come back and sink again. So if you want to think of it this way, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the, week, of the year, that's the secular year, Rosh Hashanah is like your physical birthday. Passover 
is like your spiritual birthday. You've got two birthdays. If you're a saved person, you've got two birthdays. You've got two firsts. You've got the day that you were born physically into this world. You've got the day that you were born spiritually into the kingdom of God. That's like Rosh Hashanah and Passover, Pesach. Both are true, both are applicable to the same person. Now you know something very interesting to me. We all celebrate our physical birthdays. How many of you have ever celebrated your spiritual birthday? Do you even remember exactly when your spiritual birthday was? It did come at a point in time, though you were elect, if you're among God's elect, you were elect from eternity past, you were chosen in Christ, you were irresistibly drawn to Christ out of your sinful past, and at some point, God regenerated you by his Holy Spirit and drew you to himself, and you trusted Christ. And you were born again. Jesus speaks of that in John 3. Maybe you remember when it happened. Do you remember the day? Oh, you remember the events, but do you remember when it was? Have you ever celebrated? Which is more important? Your physical birthday? Or your spiritual birthday? That's the one in which you should rejoice. That's what we have before us here. We always focus on the temporal stuff that we get on our physical birthdays. That's why we like the physical birthdays. But your spiritual birthday, you entered into the riches of Christ, into possessions that were purchased for you by the blood of the Lamb. That's really the first day of your year, just like for Israel. Exodus 12:3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Did you pick that up? A lamb for an house. Not merely a lamb for each individual. In fact, if there was a household that was too small, they should get together with another household that was fairly small as well so that there would be a lamb, but it would cover an entire house. Do you know what that foreshadows? That foreshadows a very important New Testament doctrine. The doctrine of household salvation. The children were safe in the house under the blood. There might be infants there. Infants couldn't have killed the lamb. They were safe in the house under the blood. You know, it's interesting, as we read the New Testament, we have indications of this in many different places that God works in families. Acts, Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 30. You all know this passage. It's the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas have been cast into prison. They've been beaten. The magistrates not knowing that they were Romans. And uh, God causes an earthquake to happen that night. And the prison doors are all popped open. It's interesting, the prison didn't collapse, just the doors popped open. The stone walls didn't fall on top of the prisoners or on anybody else, but the shackles fell off. It's a supernatural earthquake to do that. The jailer comes running in, he's going to kill himself because if the prisoners get away, he's dead meat. He finds they're all still there, Paul says, don't hurt yourself. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Remember, they had been singing. Ah, oh, dear people. You never know what your songs will do to those around you. What kind of music do you sing? What comes out of your lips? I was talking with a person recently who'd been in the hospital within the last month. And um, as they were being wheeled down to get their tests done, they were singing on their cart. They were singing hymns <laughs> and singing them quite loudly. I thought, sounds like Paul and Silas in the jail there at Philippi. You know, the jailer had never heard that happen before. And that's why he asked one question. He knew there was something different about these people because of what they sang. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He knew he was lost. The apostles would have been singing scripture set to music. 
Oh, how powerful the Word of God is when set to music. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And there are three more words in that verse. Most people stop after thou shalt be saved. It says, And thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night. He washed their stripes. He was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Did you get it three times? It says it in the text there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 13 and 14. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, that is, set apart by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Hagioi. That's the word that everywhere else in the New Testament is translated saints. Those who have been set apart for salvation. Even when there's only one believer in the household among the parents. There are some really great promises in the Word of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. We normally think of sanctification following salvation. Sanctification means to set apart. It says here, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. He chooses you, he sets you apart, and he brings you through belief of the truth to the salvation that he has promised. That's what it says. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. If he starts the process, will he finish it or will he drop you somewhere along the line? Philippians 1, 6 being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If he begins it, he will do it. He will finish it. You know, many, many, many years ago, before I had any children, I used to agonize over the thought before I was even married. Lord, if I got married and then had a bunch of kids, which... God obviously gave me. I don't want to see any of them end up in hell. Better not to have children than to, than to parent children who end up in hell for all of eternity. That is why I think that God has given us these promises. Your salvation did not depend on your works. And your children's salvation does not depend on your works either or on their works. It depends on the grace of God. The question is, has God given any promises to believing parents to have hope for their children? Now, the temporal affairs of your children will be determined by decisions that you make here. Their temporal success and happiness will be determined by decisions that you make here and now. Their sins will bring consequences here and now too. But ultimately, the issue of their salvation is determined in eternity by God. So has he given us some promises that we can, with eagerness and with anticipation, look forward to? And I believe he has. That's why I think it is so interesting here, where it talks about a lamb for an house. Because the Lamb is a picture of Jesus Christ. And the children inside that house were safe as well as the adults, even though they may not have had any idea of what was going on. So as Christian parents, we look forward to the day. And our children must take that step of faith themselves. It's not just because they're in the family, okay, well, I'm on my way to heaven. They must individually and personally trust Jesus Christ alone. But these verses give hope and encouragement and comfort to parents. 
Did you notice it said the entire lamb had to be consumed? None was to be left over for others to consume after Israel left Egypt. I can just imagine. Israel has been cooking these lambs. I mean, there are millions of people cooking millions of lambs all over the land of Goshen. So they eat a bunch of it, and they're not too hungry, and they had a really big lamb, and, you know, so they leave it around. Who's going to eat it the next day? Egyptians smell this delicious smell. I don't know if you've ever had roast lamb, but it is great. It is delicious. The Egyptians have been smelling this smell, and they come looking, you know, the Hebrews are gone, and Pharaoh and all of his armies are gone, and the, the regular Egyptians come out looking for where's that smell coming from, and, wow, look at this good food. There is no such thing as leftover salvation. There was to be no leftover lamb. And it was to be burned with fire. Because that gives us a picture of what Jesus Christ suffered for us. He wasn't merely in the grave. He suffered the pains of hell. He paid the penalty that you and I would have had to have paid, and we being finite beings would have had to have paid it over an infinite period of time. You can't even call it time. Over infinity, over eternity. But he is an infinite being, not finite. And so he could suffer an infinite amount of the wrath of God. He could suffer the infinite, inf, infinite pains of hell in a finite period of time because he is God. Everything that was left over was to be totally consumed with fire. Verse 5, the lamb had to be a perfect male. The text makes a point of that. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Now, you could have had a perfect female lamb. It wouldn't work. You can have all the female goddesses you want to, and they won't work either. It had to be a perfect lamb. It couldn't be a perfect pig. It couldn't be a perfect cow. It had to be a perfect lamb. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Be a sheep or a goat. More of that in a moment. Then we get down to verse 6. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Why in the evening? Well, the Passover is going to take place that night, but you know, Israel's day begins at evening. You know why it begins at evening? Because that's the way God did creation. Day one, evening and morning. Day two, evening and morning. Day three, evening and morning. Go back to Genesis chapter one and you'll read it there. The day begins in the evening on the Jewish calendar. When the first star comes out at night, that's the beginning of the new day. And so they were to do it in the evening. You shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. We're going to be talking about those other elements that God gives here, the Lord willing, next week. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water. You may like it boiled, but God doesn't want it boiled. God wants it roasted in the fire because of the picture that that gives of the suffering of Christ. Everything, the head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof, all of it. Jesus Christ paid a full sacrifice, not a partial sacrifice for our sins. You shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it. You're not lounging around, not looking for a big meal. You're going to take a big long nap afterwards. You eat it with your loins girded. Get ready to walk. You're going to be able to walk out the door the minute that you're done with this. Your shoes on your feet. Nobody running around in clogs or in bedroom slippers. Your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It's mine. Do it my way, says God. You better not disobey me on this because if you disobey me, if you disobey me in the least, you will die. When you get to the Passover, there are no options. There is no flexibility. You do it God's way. And that's the way it is with Christ. There are no options. There is no flexibility. Either you do it God's way or you die. 
God was teaching some very practical object lessons like we teach to our children to communicate some very deep and important spiritual truths concerning the one who was to come. And it's stated again that, as we've seen multiple times going through the, the ten different plagues, this was to be a judgment on the gods of Egypt. You see, this would give proof of who you trust by what you do. And for you today, here in this place, or watching over the internet, proof of who you trust is shown in what you do. Genuine faith in Christ transforms the life. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. God changes lives. You don't change your life and hope you get it right for God. When you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart and in your life, and all the dead old stuff falls away, and new life begins to sprout and bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. You can tell whether or not you're saved by how it has affected your life. If your life is not in the process of being transformed, none of you are perfect yet, neither is this preacher, but if your life is not in the process of being transformed, you are not saved. Because God always changes the people that he saves. None of us are good enough to start with. We come to him as lost sinners, undone, headed for hell. And he changes not merely our actions, but he changes our speech. He changes our thought processes. He changes our attitudes. Oh, attitudes, that's a tough one. He changes our motives. What is it that motivates you? I mean, deep down, what is it that motivates you? God transforms the life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's design is to show his will not only in you, but through you. We have it here. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. God has definite times for when he does the things that he does. I hope you're ready for it when it comes. I hope you've trusted Christ and have not just put it off, are not just putting around playing with the doctrine of salvation, thinking about, well, you know, uh, maybe when I get a little bit older, after I've had fun and after I've done all the things that I want to do, then when I get old, then I'll trust Jesus. You're playing with fire. You're playing with death. You're playing with your life. You're playing with eternity. Don't risk it. We're not talking about gambling in Atlantic City. You can lose stuff in Atlantic City. We're talking about losing your soul in hell forever. That's not a game you want to play. Today is the day of salvation. It's appointed time is now. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, make it today. Because it may be this night that the angel of death passes over and you're not under the blood. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. How thankful I am that I'm under the blood of the Lamb. When I see the blood, God looks for the blood of the Lamb. I will pass over you. Oh, dear ones, 
Do you know that you're under the blood? God had spared the land of Goshen from the previous very bad plagues, but he was not going to spare anyone, even in the land of Goshen, who did not have the blood over the doorposts. Something else we learn as we look at these verses here. God was going to use the tenth plague to teach a very important biblical doctrine, one of the key doctrines of all the Bible. He was going to use it to teach the doctrine of substitutionary redemption. Substitutionary redemption. If Israel failed to obey the Passover instructions, all of their firstborn children and animals would have also died in the plague. There's a redemption going on here. It says so in chapter 13, the very next chapter. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. It is mine. Are you a firstborn? God says you're his. It's powerful. He's given you a special calling. It is mine. Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand of the Lord brought you out, out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Eve. Did you know, and you probably picked it up as we read through that passage, Passover is a per permanent, perpetual feast because it speaks of the eternal, permanent, perpetual sacrifice of Christ. It's forever. It can't be repeated. It can only be memorialized. That's why the Roman Mass is a blasphemy. The sacrifice of Christ is a sacrifice never to be repeated, duplicated, or annulled. If you've been with us for a communion service, you know that as I present the communion elements, I make it clear that we are not doing what Rome does. In the Roman Catholic Mass, when the priest elevates the host, which is the cup with the wine and the wafer on top, and he says, we offer unto the only true and living God in Roman Catholic theology. At that very moment, that becomes transubstantiated. In other words, although it still looks like a wafer, it actually becomes the body of Christ. Though it still looks like the wine, it becomes the blood of Christ. And Christ is re-sacrificed. And so in Catholic theology... Christ is being perpetually sacrificed all around the world as the time zones change when the priest elevates the host and Jesus is sacrificed all over again. There was only one real Passover. It was to be memorialized to remind the people of the once and for all Passover when they exited Egypt. Egypt is a picture and type of the world in Scripture. When you got saved, you changed your citizenship. You're no longer a citizen of the world. You're a citizen of heaven. And you should leave the things of the world behind. John tells us over in 1 John, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, you got a new citizenship, abideth forever. So many of the pictures that we have given to us here in Exodus are repeated for us in the doctrinal sections of the New Testament because what we have here is substitutionary redemption that is going on. By the way, let me just pause and say one other thing here because it's pertinent. 
You know, Rome, like many of the reformers, believed that Israel is the church and the church is Israel. And that's why Rome thought they had to perpetuate the sacrifice through transubstantiation or the Lutherans with their consubstantiation. It doesn't actually change into the body and blood of Christ, but he is spiritually present in the elements. That's the consubstantiation, means with the substance. Rather than Zwinglian view, which is what we hold, which is the memorial element, we do it in memory of him, not because it's changed into him. It does not pay to confuse Israel with the church. Verse 14, this day, and our time is running out, this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You get it? A memorial. Only one real Passover, the night they came out of Egypt, Every other Passover that was to be celebrated every year was to be for a memorial. And you shall keep it to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. And then it goes on into talking about the unleavened bread. And I'd wanted to, I'd hoped we'd get as far as the unleavened bread today. Uh, but, oh, and why is unleavened bread connected with Passover. And I wanted to talk today also about the Feast of First Fruits, because the Feast of First Fruits occurs during the Passover season also. And all three of those things point to Christ. The unleavened bread speaks of being without sin. We'll cover it more next week, the Lord willing. I hope for four in this series. So number next week is number three. Unleavened bread speaks of that which is without sin. Leaven is a type and picture of sin in Scripture. But the Feast of first fruits, the waving of the grain, is a picture of the resurrection. Paul says so over in 1 Corinthians. Did you know that? Three feasts of the Lord. There are seven feasts of the Lord. And three of them bunched together before Pentecost, which is 50 days later, which is the prophecy of the coming Holy Spirit. That's the feast that portrays the Holy Spirit. But three of the feasts are bunched together right around Passover because they speak of the death of Christ. They speak of the sinlessness of Christ. They speak of the resurrection of Christ. Lord willing, we'll continue that next week. And then I want to also talk about, and I hope I can get through it next week as well, I want to talk about the symbolism of the other elements in the Passover meal. We read through that just a moment ago in addition to the lamb. I want to talk about the way that the Jews today celebrate Passover. I want to talk about the four cups at the Passover Seder and the relationship of those four cups that Jesus gave to the disciples at the Last Supper. I want to talk about the Haggadah, the Passover book that contains the Seder order of service. I want to talk about the Afikoman. Do you know what the Afikoman is? Have you ever even heard of the Afikoman? How many of you have heard of the Afikoman? At least one person has heard of the Afikoman. I want to talk about the Afikoman next week. It's in the Passover Seder. I want to talk about the special place set at the Passover table, even today in an observant Jewish home, a special place and a special cup set for Elijah. And all of it goes back to prophetic scripture. The Passover. Listen carefully or die. That's what God told Israel. And to everyone today. You must do it God's way or you will die. You listen carefully or die. And it's not just physical death. For it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. The question is what will you face for all of eternity? And do you have the blood over the doorpost dripping down and on either side? Are you under the blood of the cross? Are you safe inside? Have you partaken of God's Passover lamb? Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, Jesus. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your Passover lamb that you've warned us in advance that when you see the blood you will pass over and we will live. 
Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanseth us from all sin. In Jesus' name, amen.